have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, as we've titled this message, God's Plan. That song reminds me of an old story. It was at a little church on a Wednesday night service. At that little church on a Wednesday night, they took a time for blessings and for uh, just a way to be thankful. The story goes, that little old church on a Wednesday night, the church, we're going around the church and people were giving blessings. And at the church that night was a former pastor, maybe 85, 80, 89 years old. And the way I heard the story, during the middle of that service, he gets up in the middle of that service, stands up at his pew in his frail arms, and he said to the other pastor there, Pastor, I just want to thank the Lord for Jesus. He's all I have. He sits back down. Of course, people said amen and kept on going in this little small church on that Wednesday night, standing up, other for family and for financial blessings. And a few moments later, this pastor, this old pastor, retired pastor, gets back up on those frail arms, 85, 90 years old, shaking there in the pew. He said, Pastor, I said all I have is Jesus, but all I need is Jesus. And he sits back down. That'd be a lesson for you and I, should it not be? Maybe you feel like all you have is Jesus. My friends, all you need is Jesus Christ. And this morning as we look at Acts chapter 10, I'm going to ask us to examine ourselves about where our worship is. You see, you don't have a worry problem. You have a worship problem. You don't have a drinking problem. You have a worship problem. You don't have an attitude problem. You have a worship problem. And it's time that we begin to realize, understand that, that who we need ought to be who all we have, Jesus Christ. And in this passage in Acts chapter 10, there's a lot of details. It's a long story, and we'll probably read most of you of your Bibles. If not, it'll be on the screen for you, because it's just an interesting account in Acts chapter 10, a beautiful story. It's kind of, seemingly at first glance, a random accounting in the book of Acts. Some characters that have not been introduced before in Acts, we're going to find, and then some, some old characters that we know. Peter will be in there, and uh, we'll find out. But, but we're going to find out that God's going to have some very specific instructions. We're going to see God's plan, because in Acts chapter 10, it is the foundation, the biblical foundation, for why almost all of us, if not all of us, can be here this morning. In Acts chapter 10, we're going to find out that God is, is going to completely reveal himself not now just to the Jews in the Jewish nation, but now to Gentiles. And anyone who is not a Jew is a Gentile. I would dare say that most of us, if not almost everyone, and maybe all of us in here, would be Gentiles. And we are here because God in his mercy, in his grace, in his love, has enabled us and gifted us the ability to come to him, and we're Gentiles. And it's in Acts chapter 10 that we find out how God's going to work. And so this touches all of us, all of us. So let's this morning ask God's help and blessing with the thought, do I have a worship problem and see what God has for us? All right, let's ask God's help right now. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, working in and among us, Lord. And thank you that you are all we need in life. And Lord, I pray that today our hearts will be challenged. Lord, take this time as we look at your word and, and would you strengthen us? Lord, would you build us up? Lord, I pray that we would leave this place closer to you and more in tune with Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that if there's someone here who has a worship problem, that today they would shift their attention and worship to you. Lord, if someone here is not saved, then the ultimate act of worship, would they, Lord, repent and believe in you today? Lord, we're praying for your help. Keep this service free from distractions. We need you, Lord. I need you this morning. We'll give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, I ask. Amen. We're going to understand in Acts chapter 10 that God rewards, honors, and is pleased with those that seek him. But more so, we're going to discover that God is pleased with those that seek only him. You see, it's not enough just to add God as another element in our life. The Bible says in other portions of the Scripture that, that God is a jealous God. And when we think of jealousy, we often think in a negative sense. 
But there's a sense of holy, reverent jealousy where God doesn't want to share worship with anything or anybody. God does not want to share in your life his place of priority with anything else, not with another false god, which many would shudder at that, but not with your own goals and dreams. God wants to be the one and only God in your life. In Acts chapter 10, look please there on the screen or in your Bible, in Acts chapter 10, we begin in verse number 1, where the Bible says, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man, and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. We'll pause there at that point. We're introduced in this chapter to Cornelius, this man. The Bible says that he was a centurion. He was in a place of leadership. He was obviously in the Roman army. That's why he was a centurion. He led men. And it says he was of the Italian band. Now we find out from scholars, or we find out from scholars that the Italian band uh, was uh, was headquartered in a certain place, and here we find out that these people were, were headquartered in uh, Caesarea. Now, this was a place hated by Jews, and a place of uh, a tense pagan worship. In fact, in Caesarea, there was a temple to the emperor Caesar. In the Roman government and the Roman religion, Caesar was God. And Caesarea was a place of dedication to Caesar as God, a temple there. And everyone in Caesarea would have been obligated in some sense or called to worship Caesar. Yet this man, Cornelius, the Bible says, worshiped not Caesar, but God. Or in essence, a truth for you and I to grasp in a place where it wasn't popular, in a place where the multitudes weren't on the same page, in a place where it was easy to worship other things, it was still possible and called and honored to worship God. You and I, you and I live in a world where it's easy not to worship God. But it's no excuse. There is no excuse that we can claim. He couldn't claim his job, he couldn't claim his environment, he couldn't claim his upbringing. He had a simple choice to make, whether to worship Caesar or worship God. And the Bible says he chose to worship God. Do you have a worship problem this morning? He was in charge of the Italian band. It was the headquarters of an army called the Army of Occupation, headquartered here. They tell us that it was one of the elite group of soldiers, the Italian band, the Army of Occupation. So Cornelius, in, 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 in effect, was not a unknown and not a unlearned or even an untrained individual. He had some prestige. He had some honor. He had some things going for him that, that would have alluded that he could have probably even furthered his career if he decided to fully worship Caesar. But he didn't. He worshiped God. And you and I are called to worship God. Well, the Bible says that he was devout. He feared God all his house. Did he in effect on others? It affected his life. He gave much alms to people. And he always prayed. It'd be good to always pray. We can learn a lot from Cornelius, but that's not the point of the message. But there's a lot there that, that this man was, was devout the Bible says in verse number three that he saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming to him and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodges with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them 
to Joppa. As we unpack this account, this story, I notice a few more things that, that happened. Number one, Cornelius is still praying, but at some point there is a message from God for him. Now in this passage, we find that God sent it by a vision. Now God, just so you know, he could, but he does not send visions the same way he did in the Bible times. Now we have the word of God. It is clear. In fact, Peter references this later on. Peter, uh, in, in, in his book, that he, epistle that he wrote, he said, we saw God and we heard the voice of God and we have a more sure word, the word of prophecy. But they didn't have the Bible like we have it now. And so Cornelius was praying and, and it is, it's evidence that he was not fully aware of all about Jesus Christ, but he just knew there was God, there was deity, there was a creator, and he was worshiping him, and he was letting it affect his life. And so as he's seeking God, he wants to worship God fully. God reveals himself to him. And this is true throughout the Bible, that when someone seeks God, God will show himself to him. You see, sometimes we wonder, God, where are you? And the problem is not with God, it's with me. It's with you. We're like, yeah, pastor, I prayed about it for two minutes. And you spend two weeks solving it yourself and two minutes in prayer. Listen, Cornelius was devoted to God and he prayed it and God revealed himself. And, and, and I love, in scripture often the message of God comes with a name. Cornelius, what is it, Lord? That's what he said. What is it, Lord? <laughs> you know that God knows how to speak individually to us? You know, he knows who you are. He knows who I am. And I love the fact that Cornelius didn't argue. He didn't ask for another explanation. He simply obeyed. Listen, this is not where we're going, but these, this is good stuff for all of us, for you and for me. Like to simply obey. When God says something, to simply follow it. To simply just do what he says. Cornelius didn't say, listen, Lord, I like your plan, but I have a better plan. Lord, I hear your plan uh, to send a few men to Joppa, but let me, let me improve upon that plan. Uh, can you clarify the plan? What happens after Joppa, after I ask Simon, uh, uh, the, at Simon the Tanner's house and for Peter, tell me the next part. Tell me all that, then I'll follow you. No, he simply took what God said and did it. You see, he was a devout worshiper of God. And when someone truly worships God, it's not just lip service. It's life service. That's why you and I have a worship problem. Because with our lips, we worship God. But it, if we don't worship with our life, it's empty worship. Well, Cornelius, used to authority as a centurion, sends some men to Simon the Tanner's house to interact with Peter. Pick it back in the scripture, please. Verse number nine. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. You notice how both men, it's mentioned they, they prayed? You know, that's an element of the Christian life in worship, that someone who truly worships correctly will spend time in prayer. And they both had purpose, purposeful time in prayer. All right, they took some time. We're going to pray. And so what's happening is Cornelius has prayed, and God answered in a vision. Cornelius sent some men, and Peter knows none of this. He just goes up the sixth hour to pray. And I love what happens next. It's just, I love the details in the story. Please pick up there. Verse number 10. And he became very hungry. All right, now this, at first glance, seems that it's useless to the story, but this is important. And I love the Bible gives, the, gives us these details. So Peter's praying, and his stomach begins to rumble and grumble. We've been there before. It's happened in church, hasn't it? Your, your stomach moves a little bit, and everybody looks, and you're like, you know, and you look too. Oh, I don't know who that was. Oh. <laughs> you know, a bunch of deceivers out there. And it says he got very hungry. And the Bible doesn't mince words. So it wasn't just a little hunger. It was a great hunger. And I believe as we look at the, this account, we find out that it was a divine hunger. Because it plays into the next part of the story. It was not an accident. The Bible is not just giving us random facts like food for thought. It's very intentional, very purposeful. And so Peter's there. And all of a sudden he realizes as he's praying, man, I'm starving. Like, I, I'm dying here. I'm very hungry. Right, and then the Bible says, and he would have eaten. 
right? He would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. All right, so apparently he's like, all right, that's it. Make the food, I'm dying. Like, get some food ready. And he's like, why can't I eat yet? Because the food's not ready yet. All part of God's plan. And while he was waiting for this food, consumed with his hunger, God sent another vision. He says to Peter this, verse number 11, and saw heaven opened, and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let it down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Now remember that Peter was praying and he got really hungry. He tried to eat. He would have eaten, but it wasn't ready yet. And then he has a vision. And in the vision, God's vision... God brings food to Peter. This seems like, at first glance, a very cruel joke. Like, if you're hungry in church and I start talking about food, like that kind of joke, and you're like, Pastor, just stop. I'm about to die this morning. I didn't have breakfast. And like, just quit it. Go into something else. Quit talking about steak or apple pie or whatever. All right? And it seems, at first glance, God, what are you doing like you're playing on my, on my emotions. You're playing on my needs. But God's not playing on his needs. God's not playing on his emotions. God's going to communicate a powerful truth. Because God wants Peter to get this lesson for us this morning as well. And so Peter hears in his vision, food's not ready. God brings down food and says, Peter, rise, kill, and eat. But the Bible tells us Peter sees that in this great sheet, this big old net, there's all types of animals Now, Peter was a Jew. According to the Jewish law, Peter could not eat unclean animals. It was against the law of God. And so Peter, though he was a Christian, though he followed Jesus Christ, he was still following some of these these laws, these Jewish laws. He was not following them out of obligation or necessity, all right, but out of a willingness to, to be like the Jews, to reach the Jews. He did not have to follow the law. Jesus made that very clear that he, he struck down that law, but Peter was still following some. So God says, Peter, arise, kill, and eat. And Peter says, look, Peter's response. Verse 14, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done three times. And the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. So understand that Peter now, three times God said, Peter, rise, kill, and eat. And Peter said, not so, Lord. Not so, I've never let, touched anything. I've never eaten anything that's unclean. And the response from heaven, what I've called good, don't call common or unclean. And three times. It's not lost on us that before when Peter was at the time of the trial of Jesus Christ, he turned against God. He rejected God. He denied Jesus. Not once, Not twice, but three times. Perhaps, perhaps, because Peter didn't know yet, I wonder if Peter thought, this is my chance to prove myself. I'm going to stay faithful to God. Peter's, the Lord's going to show him, but Peter's missing the marks again, which Peter often did along the way. But I wonder if Peter thought himself, no, I I denied Christ before. I will not deny him this time. I will stand faithful and true. And three times, and then it goes back to heaven. And now Peter's like, what was that about? You ever find that in life? You finish reading your Bible, you finish a sermon or something, and you're like, I know that God has something for me, but God, what are you trying to teach me? Like, Lord, like, what are you trying to show me? I want to follow you. I want your truth. What are you doing? And what you will find, that God will always make himself clear, but not always when you want it. 
So Peter didn't have all the details yet. He's sitting there and he's like, man, what's going on? What's going on? And then there are these men who came from Cornelius who are now at that gate of Simon's house asking for Peter. That's where we pick up here. Look there, please. Verse 20, arise therefore and get down, the, the Spirit says, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. And then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God and of good report among all the nations of the Jews, was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear words of thee. Then called he them in and lodged them. And on the morrow, Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. We find in the next little bit that that Peter will go back and he'll spend time with Cornelius. He will will hear from Cornelius uh, about praying and the vision. And I want you to notice what we're going to see this morning. Verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and he said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. This morning, as we come to verse 34 and 35, I would submit that these two verses are the point of the passage. That all those other things previously lead up to these two verses, verses 34 and 35, where the Bible says, and Peter said, God is no respecter of persons. But, but, in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. I want to point out this morning, as we look at the point or God's plan, that number one, God's arms are wide open. God's arms are wide open. This is imperative to know in this culture, in this life, that God is standing there with his arms spread as wide as they can go. And God took the time for you and I to open up Acts chapter 10 and speak to about a man named Cornelius who was a centurion, who was a member of the Italian band, who was in a pagan place, just to show him a vision, to go to Peter, who's in another place, to show him a vision, and made him hungry, and showed some animals, and did all this, so that God could reveal himself to these people. And so listen, I am no respecter of persons. My arms are wide open. Our minds will tell us that I'm not good enough. I'm not the right person to come to God. But God's mind, God's heart tells us, listen, I am not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's arms are wide open. You can worship God because his arms are wide open. Don't be deceived. Don't be misguided. God loves everyone. For God so loved the world. For 2,000 years before this, God had worked through Abraham and the children of Abraham. But here God says, listen, I'm going to display in a grand way for all eternity that my arms and everyone who believes in Christ, can receive the salvation of God. God's arms are wide open. You can worship God. You can come to God for salvation. There's no sin hindering you in that operation, in that that belief. Listen, you can come to God. This is important to know. You can. God's arms are wide open. But Peter in this passage tells us something else, though. He said, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. And here's where we begin. Here's where I want to finish this morning. God wants you to worship him. You know why God did all of this? Two reasons. One, because God's arms are wide open. And number two, he did this because Cornelius was worshiping him. The Bible says this, the father seeketh such to worship him. If you love me, keep my commandments. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Without faith is it impossible to please him. But he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You see, God is looking for those who will worship him. 
True worship is faith. True worship is reverence. True worship is obedience. How do you know what you're worshiping? Well, it's pretty, pretty plain. Number one, what you worship, you think about. And I don't just mean on a Sunday morning, but what you worship, you think about. If all you think about is your new truck, then you worship your new truck. If all you think about is that special girl, that special guy, then you worship them. God is seeking those to worship him. And yet our problem is not a worry problem. Our problem is not a sin problem. Our problem is a worship problem. And we do lip service with worship, but we don't have life service of worship. And the Bible says, Peter says, this is the whole point. In every nation, those that fear him and work with righteousness is accepted with him. God is looking for those who will truly worship him. God honors those who seek him. It's time to stop worshiping your own ideas. Because some of us worship our own ideas. That's all we think about. My own thoughts. You worship your thoughts. It's time to stop worshiping your dreams. I can't wait till next week and, and next... Uh, you're worshiping your dreams. For others, you worship your tangible assets. Isn't that a deceitful worship? That we love what we have more than who has allowed us to have them. Anything that isn't God is a worship problem. It was in Iowa. The rain had come and the roads were just a mess. It was not current time. It was the time of the wagon and the horse. And someone had crudely drawn a sign on a muddy road in Iowa. It read this way. Choose your ruts carefully. You'll be in them for the next 10 miles. My friends, I'm afraid that too often we choose our worship with no care and no concern. We just go about our life and we're consumed with everything else. And we're consumed with our children. We're consumed with our responsibilities. We're consumed with our finances. We're consumed with hurt in our life. That's all we think about. And all our mind is filled with everything but the main thing, God. And God is seeking those who worship him. And in every nation, with every tongue and every kindred, those that fear him and work righteousness find acceptance in his sight. Peter reveals a powerful truth from the word of God that our problem is a worship problem. And the message is still the same. Worship God. You know what, husbands, you need husbands? You need to worship God. Because in your worship of God, you will find the keys to being the right husband. You know what you young people need? Worship God. Worshiping God will instruct you how to be the right teenager, be the right sister, the right son. You know what you men need? You men, to worship God. Be defined by your worship, not by how much you can bench press or deadlift. And I enjoy those things. But I can't be defined by that. I must be defined by my worship. Cornelius was not defined by his military prowess, but by his devotedness to God, his worship. And God was honored. The Gentiles were revealed. Peter was called. And we read about it today because of worship. You ladies, be defined by worship. Be defined by worship. Not by what you wear to church on Monday or go to work in on, or go to church on Sunday or go to work in on Monday. Not by what a great mom you may be, not how many accomplishments you have or how beautiful you, other people think you are, but by worship. You see, there was once a tyrant, a dictator, who ordered one of his subjects into his presence when he came, he said, this is what you will do for me. 
you will make a chain. The man was a blacksmith. The peasant went back and made a chain, thick, heavy, strong. Brought the chain back to the tyrant, and the tyrant said, double it. He went back to his shop. He made it longer and doubled the length. Brought the chain back to the tyrant. The tyrant said, with this chain, you will be bound for the rest of your life. See, this is what the devil does. The devil in his deceitfulness makes us create our own chain and bind us in them. But what God does is breaks the chains of bondage. And Peter finishes one verse and we'll close today. Please look in verse number 43. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. You see, when you have correct worship, you find everything else you need. Remission of sins, that little phrase there, could easily be passed over. It does not just mean a pardon, though it includes pardon. It means deliverance. It also means this, it is as if they've never happened. It is as if they have none effect in your life. So that worry that weighs you down, worship of Christ, true worship and faith and reverence breaks the bondage. The lust struggles you may face, worship, true worship defeats. You see, everything we need is bound up in Jesus Christ. And like that frail 85-year-old retired pastor, you know, all I need is Jesus. You see, this morning, you don't have an anxiety problem. You have a worship problem. You don't have a drug problem. You have a worship problem. You don't have a lust problem. You have a worship problem. And this morning, God calls us to worship him. And if you've allowed other things to creep in, in this morning, do business with God. Say, God, I'm sorry. I want to put you back here, and I want to worship you. I want to diligently seek you. I want devotion towards you. I want to reverence you, but I want to worship you. Not just here, but here. Music